This is Christy, and we have merchandise. Go to howtolovelitpodcast.com and check out amazing t-shirts, mugs, stickers. If you love great quotes, we have some of our favorites. If you love silliness, check out our mascot, Brain Man. Go to howtolovelitpodcast.com, clip on the shop button, and find something for that person who needs to be reminded that we are fashion creatures but half made up. Mary Shelley said that. I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. In concluding our series on Kate Chopin, we will again uh, take a break from classical literature and focus on an actual living icon, uh, a woman who also has made great use of bird, or, or rather butterfly, symbolism. Today, we will discuss the songwriting and the use of local color uh, by the living legend, a truly inspirational woman who not really only pursued her own dreams, but after having conquered the world for herself, she set her sights on improving the world of others, and that would be Tennessee's own Dolly Parton. Uh, for those who haven't caught the entirety of the Chopin series or don't know what we mean by local color, let's talk about what that is and how Dolly Parton made a legend out of the local color of her region, which is Northeast Tennessee. Well, in a general sense, the local color movement is a literature movement from the end of the 19th century. We talked about that last few weeks. It's fiction and poetry, but it focuses on characters, dialect, customs, landscape, and other really particular features of a cert of a particular cultural region of the country. Well, of course, in the case of Kate Chopin, you know, she focused on the culture of the Creole people of southern Louisiana. Mark Twain, who we haven't featured yet, but lots of people know, he's associated with, you know, the Mississippi River region and Missouri. But Dolly Parton is from our state of Tennessee, and although Memphis is on the way other side, we are still in Dolly Parton's home state. While Memphis overlooks the Mississippi Wet River because we're in West Tennessee, Dolly Parton comes from Appalachia or the Smoky Mountain region. That's actually 400 miles across on the other side, on the northeastern side of the state. Well, just in case, you know, you're not geography savvy. Um, <laughs> if you're not familiar with the, the southern region of the United States, you may not realize how long the state of Tennessee actually is. It's 440 miles or 708 kilometers, you know, from the eastern border to the western border. Uh, our side borders Mississippi and Arkansas. Dolly's side borders Kentucky and Virginia. You know, to put in perspective, Dolly Parton's hometown of Sevierville is actually almost as close to us as if compared to if we were going to go to the Canadian border, if that puts it in perspective. That means it seems so far away. I know. And Dolly's writing is characterized in large part by her storytelling. And many of her stories are about growing up in what we call the Smokies. She sings about the land and the culture of the mountain people who live there. These are people who often have been called hillbillies. <laughs> that can be considered a derogatory term, by the way. Uh, and lots of times you'll see them represented as cartoons. They'll be wearing overalls, missing teeth, making whiskey out in the woods. She took these stereotypes, as well as the beautiful landscapes of the Smoky Mountains, to craft a cultural legacy that is way more sophisticated and enduring than the blonde wigs and the fake boobs that we associate with, Di with Dolly's, you know, persona, her public persona. Parton has written over 3,000 songs. 450 of them have been recorded. Her song, I Will Always Love You, which she wrote in 1974, shot up to number one at the time, but it shot up again when Whitney Houston recorded it in 1992 and has been or is one of the most successful American songs of all time. 
She's recorded 46 solo albums and 13 studio-made ones. But her career is more than just records. She's made movies, built a theme park, started a literacy foundation that has distributed over hundreds of millions of books to children in the world. And she was instrumental in funding the research for the COVID-19 vaccine here recently. Well, today uh, we focus on Dolly Parton as a songwriter. We will talk a little bit about her personal story and career, but mostly we want to feature her written work. And we will highlight three of her most popular works, number one of which is I Will Always Love You, and then Eagle, When She Flies, and then, of course, Code of Many Colors. I mean, there were a lot of songs to choose from. 3,000, you know, <laughs> we go down these. I know, and so many of them are, you know, really beloved. There's a broad range of styles in, in her music, more than most people think. I mean, she's famous for country music, but she writes and performs gospel music, pop music, show tunes, rockabilly, anything. I do want to credit a woman uh, that we're leaning on heavily for this episode, musicologist Lizzie Hem- Hemisley. She's an ap- academic who's extensively worked in studying Dolly Parton's written work and published a book called Unlikely Angel, the Songs of Dolly Parton. There is so much to say about Parton's work. Obviously, we can only scratch the surface, but let's start by providing a little context in regard to the region. We, of course, are proud Tennesseans, But in case you are not familiar with our little state here in the mid-southern region of the United States, let's talk about what is amazing about Tennessee. (laughs) (laughs) Well, sure, like we said, Tennessee is a long state, but it's also a skinny state. It's only 112 miles from top to bottom, north to south, and it goes from the Mississippi River all the way to the Virginia border. And because it's so long geographically uh, and culturally, there's actually a lot of diversity And uh, we see it with the food and we see it with the music. I mean, Memphis, where we live, is known for some of the best barbecue in the world. And uh, Memphis barbecue is slow cooked and it can be wet or dry. It can be ribs or pulled pork. And Memphis boasts that uh, not only is it uh, the second fattest city in the United States, but it aims to be number one thanks to the barbecue. We do love it. Uh, Now, I want to point out one interesting thing. The Tennessee state flag has three stars on it. Those stars represent the three sections of Tennessee, east, middle, and west. Uh, We're also known for our sharp wit, I would like to say. Uh, (laughs) Memphis is also the home of the blues and B.B. King, and it's home to Elvis, uh, which we should feature sometime. And it's where Johnny Cash and many other icons recorded here at Sun Studios. And uh, But if you go up I-40, about 180 miles, you end up in Nashville, and that is the home of country music. Uh, The home of the Grand Ole Opry and the Country Music Hall of Fame, it's where uh, Dolly Parton lives today. You know, she's not the only one. You've got um, Keith Urban and Billy Ray Cyrus and Taylor Swift and Kelly Clarkson and, you know, endless musicians that are calling Nashville home. Uh, It's an epicenter for a lot of American music. But if you keep driving another 207 miles up I-40... The interstate that crosses our state, you'll arrive at exit 407. That is the exit to Sevierville and those Smoky Mountains made famous by Dolly Parton. Uh, The Great Smoky Mountain Park is the most visited national park in the country. And uh, the region has uh, rivers for rafting and trails for hiking. And uh, the most fun thing we love the most, black bears. Oh, yeah. Uh, Everyone drives around on the lookout for a black bear sighting. And uh, it's part of the Appalachian Mountain Range. But it's called the Smokies because there's a natural fog that often hangs over the range and uh, presents as just large smoke plumes from a distance. I mean, it's beautiful and inspiring, and it is home to Dolly Parton. Well, she was born in a town called Sevierville on January 19th, 1946. Today, of course, Sevierville is a tourist trap. (laughs) It has outlet malls, a strip with restaurants, hotels, endless shows, But most famously, it's home to the theme park we call Dollywood. We have a picture of Dollywood on our website when we visited there last summer with our family. If you want to see what the entrance looks like, most everyone in our area who eventually makes the pilgrimage to Dollywood loves it. We love the rides, the shows, especially around Christmas. But we also love, and this is one thing people don't know about, the food. Dollywood may be the only theme park that I know of that's known for good 
food. <laughs> that is we, rare. I know, because we usually think of theme parks as having cardboard pizza and funnel cakes. But traditional mountain home cooking was a must for Dolly. <laughs> you know, she has a famous fried uh, chicken recipe that was her mother's. And they serve it at Aunt Granny's Restaurant, which, uh, by the way, has won the top slot for best theme park food in America. Who knows how competitive that actually is. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine. I mean, you know, Dollywood is full of butterflies. And if you know anything about Dolly Parton, you know she loves her butterflies and uh, everything Dolly has butterflies, but she loves eagles too. And if you're looking for literary motifs, there you go, birds <laughs> again. And uh, Dollywood actually has a bald eagle sanctuary. And uh, I should also mention that our favorite Dollywood roller coaster is called the Wild Eagle Ride. Oh, yes. I'll never forget last summer, we'd hit every ride in the park multiple times, waiting on the fireworks show. It started to rain. And Anna and Lizzie jumped back on the wild eagle and rode it with their feet dangling in the rain. So it, crazy. It was. And I would like to point out it was not a light rain. It was a driving no. rain. And they had the most fun of the night. But no day. lightning. True. You know, Dollywood has a water park too, but it's not near as busy as Disney World or our Bush Gardens. I mean, it celebrates the Smoky Mountains. And uh, highlights maybe even, it might even glamorize the culture of the Appalachian people. Well, it is a lot of fun, and we've been going there since my girls were little, and we love it. But going back to when Dolly lived in Sevier County, none of that, of course, existed. It was a threadbare, poor, dirty, and hungry part of Appalachia. The Appalachian region to this day is noted for its incredible poverty. I mean, we don't think of the U.S. as having entire regions of poverty because the U.S. is an incredibly affluent country, but in the mountains of Appalachia, there are still many places where people live in Depression-era style poverty. When Anna was a freshman at the University of Tennessee, which is just up the road from Sevierville, she had a friend from Hancock County, which is in the region. She learned in her friend's county, now this was in 2016, but in 2016, only half the town had running water. So that kind of poverty really does still exist in those mountains. Gary, what is making Appalachia so poor? Uh, you know, that's an excellent question, and it's really not simple to solve. Um, the U.S. government has spent over $4.5 billion uh, on over 28,000 projects in the region, most of which, most famous of which would have been TVA. Uh, but it's still one of the poorest areas in the country, and it's a large area. Uh, Appalachia is not just the northeast corner of Tennessee. It's West Virginia, uh, as well as Eastern Kentucky, they fall into this area. And there are a lot of stereotypes that try to explain away the problems by, you know, calling the people of Appalachia ignorant or lazy. And the term hillbilly has been um, used to describe them. And the term is coming even backwards, poor white people, you know, a negative label. And obviously the real truth behind Appalachian poverty is extremely complex and more than we can get into for this podcast. But let me say this, Dolly Parton single-handedly has done more than any person in destroying those stereotypes and in even using them to her advantage. And let me quote her. She said this to a reporter one time who asked her about her home. They portray mountain people like we are all these dumb barefoot hillbillies. I think country people are the smartest people in the world, and I've been everywhere. <laughs> I know she has, and I love that. You know, Barbara Walters, the interviewer, one time uh, asked her this, Dolly, where I come from, I would have called you a hillbilly. And to which Dolly quickly responded, well, if you had, it would have probably been very natural, but I'd have probably kicked your shins. <laughs> We're the ones you would consider the little Abner people, Daisy May and that sort of thing. They took that from people like us. But we're a very proud people, people with class. It was country class, but it was a great deal of class. And of course, Lil Abner and Daisy May are cartoons. But the truth of the matter is, Parton was raised very, very poor. But that did not mean she was raised without dignity, and that's an important distinction. Today, at least in many circles of the first world, we associate poverty with irresponsible behaviors like drug use, idleness, lack of hygiene, uh, people who don't have pride and, and don't try to take the initiative to, to live responsibly or properly. But Dolly Parton reminds us that you can be poor, 
hardworking, proud, and very dignified. And you know, she's so funny about it. In her biography, she says that her family was so poor that the ants used to bring back food they'd taken from us because they felt sorry for us. Uh, she makes it seem lovable, but the reality was was really rough. I read about an incident in Parton's childhood where she stepped on a broken jar and almost severed three toes, and they had no means to go to a doctor, so her mother, Avi, sewed the toes back on herself. That is incredibly ingenious, and I don't think I'm smart enough to even <laughs> try to pull that off. Uh, But what we can see, you know, you can read, there's so many anecdotes um, from Dolly's early years, but we can see there's just this high level of dignity in mountain people. We see it from her birth experience. Her parents paid the doctor for her delivery. They had no money, so they paid with a sack of cornmeal. They were going to pay for the birth of their child. She was the fourth, by the way, out of 12 children, and they were all raised in this little one-room cabin. The kids slept four to a bed, and one of them peed in the bed, she remembers. But in her song, Greatest Days of All, she says this about it. A dirt dauber built its next on my only Sunday dress, and the room leaked in my shoes, and when they dried, they were too small, and the rats chewed a great big hole in my only winter coat, and at night I'd hear them gnaw the paper off my bedroom wall. They had, you know... No indoor plumbing, no electricity, just wasn't glamorous. Oh, my gosh. And and let me add this. Uh, Those lyrics are likely not an exaggeration of the reality of poverty in Appalachia. Um, You know, in fact, if anything, uh, she has probably romanticized it a bit. The uh, Depression-era poverty that was really felt all over the United States before World War II never left Appalachia. And, you know, we know that as a statistical fact. But if you want to feel how real it is besides just looking at numbers, you can, in fact, visit Dolly's first home on Locust Ridge or even better and easier to get to, uh, you can revisit the uh, replica that she built inside Dollywood. Which we have done, of course. But Those humble roots are part of her story, and she's embraced them. I read an article from Southern Living where they asked her how she felt about being labeled a hillbilly and all the prejudice with that term, and this is what she said. To me, that's not an insult. We were just mountain people. We were really redneck, roughneck hillbilly people, and I'm proud of it. White trash I am. You know, she talks about that when you're poor and you're that uneducated, you can fall into these categories, and it's who she was as a child, and she says that's who she still is in many ways. She says this, you can't outrun it. But besides being poor and undereducated, there were things about those mountain years that helped create the talent that made her a star. For one thing, she was raised in church. Her grandfather was a preacher, and she has a moral and ethical center that's guided her all her life. She was immersed in music, southern gospel music, traditional European hymns, things like Amazing Grace, regional folk songs. Music was everywhere, and her family sang all the time, and so did Dolly. She performed in church from basically the time she could talk, and she started writing songs at age five before she can even read or write. It's documented. The first one people know about, and you can look this up, is called Little Tiny Tassel Top. It was about her doll that they had made from a corn cob. What's most amazing about this song, at least to me, for somebody that's five years old, it rhymes. When she turned seven, her Uncle Lewis gave her her first guitar, taught her a few chords, and there she was on her way. (laughs) Well, she was, but that doesn't mean she didn't work her heart off out however we want to say that she got her first spot um on a local knoxville tv station when she was 10 and she made five dollars that was more than her father made for an entire day of work at the sawmill but knoxville is not a launching pad for stardom and uh, (laughs) her sights were set on nashville 150 miles down the road and her uncle bill and she would drive back and forth to nashville in a car that had a door wired shut with a coat hanger. Uh, The goal was to get a producer to take notice of her, and they made headway. And uh, the day after she graduated from high school, Dolly moved to Nashville full-time to peddle her songs to publishers and performers. And this will be my favorite part, because on her first day in Nashville, a man by the name of Carl Dean drove by in a white pickup truck. Dolly was standing in front of the wishy-washy laundromat. 
on their 50th anniversary. And let me say, this is one of the rare occasions that the public ever got a quote from Dean. He had this to say about that day. My first thought was, I'm going to marry that girl. My second thought was, Lord, she's good looking. And that was the day my life began. <laughs> Man, that's a crazy and rare story. Well, it is. They got McDonald's drive through that on their first date. And two years later, when she was 20 years old, they got married. The only guest at their wedding was her mother. Wow. Uh, why was it so small? Well, her career had started to take off, and a record label was investing money in her. Uh, she had a hit, a single that went to 24 on the country charts. The name of that song, by the way, Dumb Blonde, <laughs> funny enough. Uh, the refrain to that song is, Just because I'm blonde, don't think I'm dumb, because this dumb blonde ain't nobody's fool. She's right about that. She had another song that was called Something Fishy. It charted at 17. She had a debut album coming out called Hello, I'm Dolly. And the record label did not want her to get married. They thought that would derail her career. Well, she told them, I ain't waiting. And she just eloped. Uh, she didn't even tell them, by the way, for a year. <laughs> she got wanted to get married in a church. They found this little Baptist church. And she asked the preacher, would you marry us? Uh, they couldn't even have a traditional honeymoon because the next day, Parton had to appear on a radio show. But the deal was made. And Carl was good with Dolly just being Dolly. <laughs> well, you know, he did go to one event with Dolly when her first record uh, went to number one. And he put on a tuxedo. He went to the dinner. He walked the red carpet. He sat through the awards. And after the dinner, um, he turned to Dolly and said this, Dolly, I want you to have everything you want, and I'm happy for you. But don't you ever ask me to go to another one of them dang things again. <laughs> <laughs> and he never has. 56 years later, they, they're still happily married. And Carl Dean is completely invisible to the public eye. And, you know, sometimes uh, if reporters come by, he's been known to tell them that he's the gardener just to try to throw him off. I mean, how could they know? I mean, he's invisible. It's really a fun story. Well, it is. And if you want to know how Dolly feels about Dean, listen to her song, From Here to the Moon and Back. She released it in 2012. 46 years after their wedding day. It's simple, it's heartfelt, it's honest, it's everything Dolly Parton. Well, well, so let's talk about some of these songs that have made us fall in love, not just with Dolly Parton, but with Appalachia and her beloved Smoky Mountains. Well, okay. Uh, in 1967, this was one year after she got married, she caught the attention of Porter Wagner, and he offered her a job as a singer. Now, this was a big deal. He had a nationally syndicated country music TV show, and it was popular. All of a sudden, as you can imagine, Dolly Parton is making $60,000 a year, and she's on TV across America. Dolly Parton and Porter Wagner became one of the most popular country music duos in the country. Their voices just naturally blended. They match. Sometimes people accuse them of being, being brother and sister. But during her time on The Porter Show, Dolly recorded 150 original songs. Some of them we still know today. Jolene, Coat of Many Colors, and of course, I Will Always Love You. She also recorded 11 duo albums. Cut them in colors, by the way. That's the perfect example of uh, local color. By using color. <laughs> so uh, Porter Wagner sang it first, but Dolly recorded on the album she called Code of Many Colors in uh, 1971. And, you know, this song shares a true and actually traumatic story from Parton's childhood. She published the lyrics as a children's book in 1996 and has used it to talk to children about bullying. Uh, in 2016, she released a new version of the book, made it into a movie. And when asked what's her favorite song, Dolly claims it's this one that's her favorite, and she sings it at every live concert. And the Library of Congress has actually added it to the National Recording Registry for being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant to American culture. What do you think of that? I know. I love it. I mean, it's autobiographical, and it's a narrative, so it's easy to follow. It's a memory. The song starts with the narrator as a grown-up, but takes us back through time to her childhood in those Appalachian Mountains. We'll read it. Back through the years, I go wandering once again, back to the seasons of my youth. 
I recall a box of rags that someone gave us and how my mama put those rags to use. They were rags of many colors. Every piece was small, and I didn't have a coat, and it was way down in the fall. Mama sewed the rags together, sewing every piece with love. She made my coat of many colors that I was proud of. As she sewed, she told him a story from the Bible. She had read about a coat of many colors Joseph wore, and then she said, Perhaps this coat will bring you good luck and happiness, and I just couldn't wait to wear it. And Mama blessed it with a kiss, my coat of many colors, that my mama made for me. Made only from rags, but I wore it so proudly. Although we had no money, I was rich as I could be. And my coat of many colors, my mama made for me. So, with patches on my britches and holes in both my shoes, and my coat of many colors, I hurried off to school. Just to find the others laughing and making fun of me in my coat of many colors my mama made for me. And oh, I couldn't understand it, for I felt I was rich, and I told him of the love my mama sewed in every stitch. And I told him all the story mama told me while she sewed, and how my coat of many colors was worth more than all their clothes, but they didn't understand it. And I tried to make them see that one is only poor, only if they choose to be. Now I know we had no money, but I was rich as I could be, and my coat of many colors my mama made for me made just for me. Well, let's talk about the narrative structure. It's in the first person. And after those first two lines, it's from the point of view of a child. That, of course, makes it compelling. But there's a lot of simple rhymes. And Dolly is a notable and an amazing rhymer. Remember, poetry, well, in poetry and songs both, uh, you don't have to have a special rhyme scheme. And she doesn't use one necessarily here. Rhyme occurs when words are close enough to each other so that your he- ear hears the connection and it links these two s- the like sounding words together. And I tried to make them see that one is only poor only if they choose to be. Now I know we had no money, but I was rich as I could be in my coat of many colors that my mama made for me, made just for me. You can hear your ear linking all the important ideas with this E sound. True. And the sentiment that she expresses is really something everyone can relate to. You don't have to have been born poor to have suffered from bullying and uh, cruelty is universal. And the story is very simple. And uh, her mother made her a coat from a bunch of different rags and the rags were all different colors. And while Dolly's mom sewed the pieces together, she told Dolly the Bible story about Joseph and his coat of many colors. And in the Bible story, Joseph's father gives him a coat of many colors to show him how much he loves him. So, you know, the connection with her coat and the coat in the Bible story made Dolly really proud to wear her coat, except when she gets to school and the other children are going to laugh at her because of the coat. Well, and that line at the end, my mama made for me, made just for me. I mean, who can resist, you know, the emotional ending? I mean, it's a punch in the gut. And you know what else is a punch in the gut? This isn't in the song, but later in her life, she told the real story. The day she wore that coat to school was picture day, and she wanted to get her picture taken in her coat that her mama had made her. And she was crying, so there were tears in her eyes, but she still, you know, smiled for her picture. She also confesses that the kids not only made fun of her, but they ripped her coat off. And she wasn't wearing a shirt underneath because she didn't have one and exposed her nakedness uh, because she didn't have the proper underclothes. Then they locked her up in a closet and left her there screaming. To this day, Dolly admits that she struggles with the dark and even sleeps with the light on. And she has ever since been locked in that closet for so long. Man, that, I mean, that really shows you the lasting impact of childhood trauma. I mean, it's an awful story. But what's so great about the song, the bullies are not the focus. The terror and the cruelty are not the focus. It's the backdrop. And she uses it to highlight the real focus. And the focus is the love her mother had for her, a love that transcends economic situations, culture, and even human cruelty. It's about love. She uses the particulars of her Appalachia poverty to highlight one of the greatest universal truths of being human. We can love in any situation, and love will lift us out of the greatest of cruelties. I mean, it's simple, but remembering that 
we have this love and it's in our power to give and receive despite the circumstances is what has kept this song popular decade after decade. All right, so we want to go to the second song, uh, which is different. But before we do, let's talk about her very unique writing process. <laughs> you know, Dolly's process is uh, unique to her, as it has to be. And Dolly, like uh, Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters, does not read music. Her writing is really uh, intuitive and spontaneous and natural, and she writes in bursts. And uh, she views it as a God-given gift. And Dolly's very serious about her songwriting. Uh, everything revolves around that, but she's also serious about her spirituality. And she often writes in the morning because that's her time with God. And sometimes she even fasts and prays before she goes into seclusion to write songs. I mean, her process is very immersive. Dolly views and often talks about her songs as being her children. You know, she never had children of her own, but she's given birth to over 3,000 songs, and she protects them like she would children. When she was working with Porter Wagner, he signed a contract with her, and she gave him 49% of her publishing company, 15% of her record royalties, but he got nothing from her songs. Elvis wanted to record I Will Always Love You, and she really wanted him to. But she said no, because he wanted to own half the copyright of the song, and she just doesn't share her children <laughs> with anybody. <laughs> well, you know, from a cultural standpoint, it makes sense. Uh, songs are an important part of Appalachia culture in general. And for women in that region, producing songs and stories is really part of your identity as a person. And um, you know, it makes sense that Dolly's songs, which are narrative in large part and often about her own life story, would be something personal and something you just wouldn't sell or even want to give away. I heard Dolly talk about it. I mean, she talks about it a lot. And she's especially glad she didn't give away the rights to I Will Always Love You because that one song has made her more money than all of her other songs combined. It's been considered to be one of the greatest love songs ever written which is ironic because it's not even a romantic song at all. <laughs> no, she wrote it in 1974. Um, she had been working on the Porter Wagner show for seven years, and she wanted to strike out on her own. But Wagner was really upset about it. So Dolly said this, There was a lot of grief and heartache there, and he just wasn't listening to my reasoning for my going. And I thought, well, why don't you do what you do best? Why don't you just write this song? I went home, and out of a very emotional place at the time, I wrote the song. Uh, the next day, Dolly went back into Wagner's office and asked him to listen to her for one minute. She sang these words to him, and he started crying. <laughs> he said this when she finished, Well, hell, if you feel that strong about it, just go on, providing I get to produce that record, because that's the best song you ever wrote. <laughs> Which, of course, he did do, and of course, the rest is history. So let's read those lyrics. If I should stay, well, I would only be in your way, so I'll go. And yet I know I'll think of you each step of the way, and I will always love you. I will always love you. Bittersweet memories, that's all I'm taking with me. Goodbye. Please don't cry, because we both know that I'm not what you need. But I will always love you. I will always love you. And I hope life will treat you kind. And I hope that you have all that you've ever dreamed of. Oh, I do wish you joy, and I wish you happiness. But above all this, I wish you love. I love you. I will always love you. I, I will always, always love you. I will always love you. I will always love you. I will always love you. You know, it's really not a love song. It's a breakup song. <laughs> it's a breakup song. Breakup song. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, look at the, the, the first two lines. If I should stay, well, I would only be in your way. So I'll go. <laughs> and yet I know. You know, again, notice how brilliant Dolly is with her rhymes. Stay, way, go, no. I really think that's a key characteristic of her style. It charms our ears. But beyond that, she's breaking up with someone in the most gracious way humanly imaginable. It's full of affection and respect. To be honest, it's a way, you know, most of us can never imagine breaking up. I mean, <laughs> our own breakups are bitter and messy, all the awful things. <laughs> True. Um, 
And her particular breakup was a professional one, but the genius of how she wrote the song is that it could be anybody's story about any separation of any kind, and you can project your own life into the song. And I know the song is played a lot at funerals, which, you know, is kind of an ultimate breakup. For but, sure. But it's been used at graduation parties, going away functions, just all different kind of things. Well, notice the refrain. I will always love you. I will always love you. I will always love you. Repetition and rhetoric is always a way to create emphasis, to show importance. The symbol and abundant repetition in this song rings of sincerity. She's saying, I really, really mean this. And we know she does. And Porter knew she meant it too. You know, uh, many people know the song, but they didn't know Parton wrote it. Uh, Whitney Houston recorded it for the movie The Bodyguard in 1992, and her rendition became the top-selling song in history by a female artist, and it sold in excess of 20 million copies globally, and, you know, it's garnered accolades everywhere around the world. And Dolly is not one bit jealous. She has many complimentary things to say about Houston's recording, and she always has. The song topped the charts when Dolly recorded it in 71 from her album Jolene. But according to Forbes, Parton earned $10 million off of Whitney Houston's rendition. Not bad. <laughs> no. You know, in 2007, Dolly sang the song again for Porter Wagoner at a special ceremony at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville just a few months before he died. Wagner talked about that night. He said this, It was the most emotional night I've ever spent at the Opry in my life. And Dolly, of course, sang the song, I Will Always Love You. And they had me sitting on a stool, and she just came and wiped some of my tears away. She meant it for me and wrote it for me, she said. That's a wonderful thing that she stood there and sang it for the whole world to see. And the evening was unbelievable. And, of course, he died just right after that. Wow. Uh, and, you know, Dolly recorded it again with Vince Gill in 1995, and various other artists have recorded it. I mean, it's one of the best-selling songs of all time. The last song I want us to talk about is one we picked especially for Edna Pontillier of The Awakening. The name of the song is Eagle When She Flies. If you remember in The Awakening, birds are a motif throughout the book, from the mockingbird and the parrot on the first page to the bird with the broken wing on the last. Now, butterflies, although they're not birds, they have wings, are usually what we associate with Parton because they're on everything. Uh, she's even recorded a song, Love is Like a Butterfly. Uh, Dolly said this about butterflies. As a little bitty child, I'd get lost chasing them into the woods. Everybody hollered at me, but I didn't care. I'm going to be a butterfly, I decided. Spread my wings and fly. But butterflies are not the only winged creature Parton loves. This is from her biography. I related to eagles somehow. Eagles are the strong ones, flying the hardest, the fastest, the highest. I didn't realize how much I write about eagles until somebody brought it to my attention. I must just relate to the idea of soaring. The song Eagle When She Flies was released in 1991. She'd been an icon, you know, by that point for years. It was her 31st solo album, if you can believe that. The album Eagle When She Flies was her first solo album to reach that number one spot uh, since the 80s, but it did go platinum. So let's read this song, Eagle When She Flies. She's been there. God knows she's been there. She has seen and done it all. She's a woman. She knows how to dish it out or take it all. Her heart's as soft as feathers. Still, she weathers stormy skies. And she's a sparrow when she's broken, but she's an eagle when she flies. A kaleidoscope of colors, you can toss her round and round. You can keep her in your vision, but you never keep her down. She's a lover, she's a mother, she's a friend, and she's a wife. And she's a sparrow when she's broken, but she's an eagle when she flies. Gentle as the sweet magnolia, strong as steel, her faith and pride. She's an everlasting shoulder. She's a leading post of life. She hurts deep, and when she weeps, she's just as fragile as a child. And she's a sparrow when she's broken, but she's an eagle when she flies. She's a sparrow when she's broken, but she's an eagle when she flies. Oh, bless her Lord. She's an eagle when she flies. You know, Dolly understands better than most, maybe, what it means to be a woman. Uh, what I mean by that, because, you know, half of the 
population are women is that she's comfortable being a woman in areas generally dominated by men. She loves womanhood and she doesn't feel any need to change herself to be like the men in her life. And it's a wonderful model. I mean, she loves everything feminine. A lot of that comes from growing up in the mountains when it was not possible really to be feminine. And she would want girly things and pretty things like makeup. And, you know, no poor woman could afford that. But after she got to Nashville, she quickly figured out she could use her femininity to become iconic, as well as to protect herself from some of the you know sexism that's just naturally inherent in show business. She created this Dolly cartoon. She likes to call it the, do- the cartoon look. This dumb blonde version of herself with the big hair and the big boobs. It made her stand out, it insulated her to some degree from harassment. But she made femininity powerful, and she threw that dumb blonde stereotype in people's faces. Everyone knew she was playing them and pretending to be stupid. It was brilliant. In some ways, she was saying, I know this is what you see when you look at me, but I dare you to think of me like this. You'll pay for it as I trample over you professionally to the top of the billboard charts. Ironically, uh, you know, this in-your-face strategy of female empowerment was not well received by serious political feminists of her day. But you know what? She could have cared less. She had an informed central vision of who she was and what she was there to do. She had a plan and it was going to work. When I started out, this is what she said, it never crossed my mind I couldn't do it just because I was a woman. I was just going to do what I did, what I felt I did best. And I never once thought that was going to ever, you know, not work for me. And I didn't care. I wasn't afraid of anybody. Do you know what great historical political (laughs) figure she reminds me of? No. Abraham Lincoln. Huh. He used that country bumpkin self-effacing. To disarm. To disarm people. And he was highly successful with that. And. You know, when I listen to the song, Eagle When She Flies, that's really what the song is about. You know, not it's about not being afraid. It's about being strong and being who you are. And uh, I was interested to read that she wrote it originally to be the theme song for the movie Steel Magnolias. And uh, that was a movie with Sally Fields and Julia Roberts. The, um, the producers rejected it, but the line, gentle as a sweet magnolia, was put in there originally as a way to tie the song to the movie and kind of give them a hook. Well, I want to talk about those lyrics, but first I want to revisit, you know, Dolly's stance on feminism because it's unique. Over her entire career, she's been asked over and over again if she's a feminist, and every time she rejects the label. She says no. Uh, Well, yeah, and that is a little surprising. I mean, she's a professional woman, and a lot of her songs are about women and womanhood and things that, you know, we would associate naturally with being a feminist. True, uh, but if you continue to read her perspective, you know, she doesn't reject female empowerment at all. She's rejecting the political definition and the connotations associated with the word feminist. She's been a woman in business, and she's watched that feminist movement from the early days of the 60s. As a woman and as an entertainer and as a businesswoman, she's, of course, very sensitive to the meaning of words. And when Dolly talks, you know, she throws that country accent around, but she chooses her (laughs) words carefully, and she uses a lot of jokes carefully. Oh, I mean, she's incredible uh, when she's facing criticism and she's using her jokes. And uh, the one that may be the most famous is the one that she uses on people who criticize her for having plastic surgery. (laughs) She just says... It costs a lot of money to look this cheap. Well, I know. Uh, What she doesn't like about the term feminist is the implication that she thinks is inherent in the term that she is a man hater. You know, the assumption that gender politics is a zero sum game and for women to get ahead, men have to be put down or that all men are bad or or that all men inherently just want to dominate women. She absolutely rejects this. She doesn't believe it. In fact, she says all the time, I love men. (laughs) You know, she says this, let me quote her in full. I don't believe in crucifying a whole group just because a few people have made mistakes. To me, the word feminist is like, I hate all men. But I'm all for all gals. I think everybody has the right to be who they are. You know, she goes on to say things like this. I think of myself as a woman in business. I love men. (laughs) 
you know, and uh, that's not to say she doesn't take political stands um, in her art. I mean, the entire musical, you may know it, Nine to Five, is about sexual harassment. The song Just Because I'm a Woman connects the political to the personal, and it's autobiographical, and it's pretty edgy. I mean, she lives with her femininity. She lives it out. And that's where we land with Eagle when she flies. You know, listen to the line. She's a lover, a mother. She's a friend. She's a wife. She's a sparrow when she's broken, but she's an eagle when she flies. There it is. Everything iconic about Dolly. The half rhymes, the repetitions, the Smoky Mountain metaphors, the imagery, but most importantly, that human compassion. People who don't even like country music, twang, love Dolly because that human compassion makes her irresistible. You know, Dolly's daddy never had a chance to go to school and he never could read or write his whole life. It embarrassed him. And according to Dolly Parton, it crippled him. She grew up and saw things like that all over the place and and never left her as rich and famous as she got over the years. For example, in 1995, she launched Imagination Library, and it was inspired by her daddy. It started just for the children of her home county of Sevier. But uh, in the program, she would mail a child a book every month of their life from birth until age five. Well, since 1995, it's grown well beyond Sevier County, and in 2020, they gave out their 150th millionth book. It's all over the world. In some places, there's books delivered in places that you can only get to by a plane or a boat. (laughs) Very impressive. Uh, You know, Dolly ends every concert with I Will Always Love You, and she turns her song about her business partner really into a song about her audience. And uh, it's her benediction. It's her blessing for her fans. It's what she wishes, and it's really what we wish for you as well. And I hope life will treat you kind. I hope that you have all that you ever dreamed of. Oh, and I do wish you joy, and I wish you happiness. But above all this, I wish you love. Thanks, Dolly. Well, I hope Dolly inspired you a little bit. I'm inspired. Uh, Next episode, we will be back to uh, traditional literature with a short story by Guy de Maupassant titled The Necklace. Thank you for listening to us today. As always, please reach out to us on any of our social media outlets. You know, the Gram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that. Visit our website where you can get some free instructional tools or where you can also buy a mug or a t-shirt at howtolovelitpodcast.com. But most importantly, if you enjoy our work, please share an episode with a friend. That is the best give you can give us. Help us grow. Thanks. Peace out. Peace out.